those are exciting yeah so the next topic is on lot the next topic is on lot and interpretation and we have dr rajesh bey and we have dr satish bey and dr ed new work ag diagnostic private limited diagnostic private so warm welcome to you for the session may i request you to kindly begin the session yeah very good afternoon everyone uh, so thank you taho and uh, to be specific thank you dr suvin for inviting me today uh, for uh, having a, a small talk on this uh, slightly debatable slightly controversial topic which is lot to lot uh, validation so let me uh, share my slides right, please go ahead. okay yeah so um, when we talk about lot to lot validation uh, the first and foremost i want to clarify that uh, this is something which is applicable to both the reagents that we use in our lab and the controls that we use in our lab so that's the first point right in the beginning that i want to make and emphasize that it applies to controls as well as reagents now the second question is that why that why is it uh, required and what are the reasons that we need to do this so we all know that the controls or reagents they come to us through our vendors uh, and they they go through a huge lot of sample transportation or the uh, and during the transportation the vendor as well as when it reaches the lab we need to maintain certain temperature and humidity conditions which are required for the storage of that control or the reagent so all these factors will impact the or contribute to the variability whenever a lot of a reagent or a control changes and hence it is required that every lab before a new lot of control or reagent is put in use we need to do some kind of a validation and confirm to ourselves and to our patients that there is no variation which is going to cause any harm in terms of the vari variability of the results so that's the whole topic and that's the reason that uh, we would like to discuss this so having said that let's straight away jump to how do we do a lot to lot validation for controls so controls you all know that we would preferably try and use third party controls for whatever section of the lab that we are talking about whether it is hematology or biochemistry so preferred always would be a third party uh, lot of controls but i know there are exceptions and uh, you may have to uh, you know use the vendor Uh, controls only uh, when the third party controls are not available in certain uh, due to certain reasons but in either which case whether it is a third party control or whether it is the primary vendor controls that you are using the requirement of lot to lot validation for a controls iqc controls remains the same so uh, there is a guideline document which we can refer to as to how we can go about this and the document is clsi c24 a4 which talks about how to go about control lot to lot validation so what this document is recommending us is that we need to have a crossover before our existing lot gets exhausted we need to have the new lot uh, being reached to us and we need to parallelly run the new lot of control as simultaneously the old old lot, lot is in process or is available to us the advantage of this is that by the time our old lot is completely getting exhausted we would have established the mean and the standard deviation of this new lot which is which we are going to put in use so we want to verify this even before it is going to be put in use now idealistically 20 points is what is the recommendation but there have been lot of papers and publications which talk about even 10 points being used as a crossover study and in the papers they have told one very important point which often is a often is a miss by majority of a majority of our labs and that is the standard deviation that we use so we need to recalculate the standard deviation from the new mean of the new lot control that i have used and apply that and see that the mean is closer to as what the manufacturer is claiming this way we will confirm to ourselves that we can straight away jump to this new lot and put it in use as our old lot gets over so th that was one very brief point in terms of control lot to lot validation and uh, so now the more discussion and more detailed discussion is required is mainly on the second part which is the reagent lot to lot validation now if we go through various laboratory practices across the world 
uh, there have been different practices that people follow in reagent lot to lot validation. This also varies from test to test and from department to department. So these are the basic things which we need to confirm before we do a lot to lot validation. So the first question we need to answer is how many number of samples that I will use. And if you look at it, as I said, across various labs, you have a huge range from minimum as minimum as three to six to 20 to 40 samples being used. Second question is the choice of samples, whether I should use only QC material, whether I should use QC and patient samples, or I should use both. What is the method of calculation used for evaluation of the two readings that I get of the same sample when I've run in old lot versus the new lot? So again, there are various methodologies, statistics, which is used either a critical difference or the percentage difference or a linear regression statistics. And finally, having known the difference, how do I say, what is the acceptance criteria? How do I set in the acceptance criteria as to whatever difference I'm seeing as to what is acceptable? So for that also, there are various thoughts. We can use by the bias which is present from the biological variation database for that particular test. We may use our IQC performance data. We may use the EQAS or our pure comparison data performance. So from this slide, what I'm trying to tell you is, I think our organizers have chosen the topic very aptly because these are the confounding questions that we have uh, when we talk about lot to lot validation. So I hope that I try and address these uh, in this uh, next uh, few slides that I'm going to show you. So when you try and ponder to all those questions which I just now told you, and if you if we look at the various uh, medical literature review, so I came across this very good article by written by Krembrowski et al. at in 2006. And uh, this author has very nicely elaborated that we should be looking at lot to lot reagent validation Based on, our, based on the performance of the test that we are talking about. So the author has said here that if we are talking about tests where the analyte is extremely unstable, like example is ACTH, insulin, where the, the storage retention uh, stability of that particular analyte is poor itself. So here the question of using patient samples as a part of lot to lot validation becomes redundant. And we will have to rely only and only on the QC material because the analyte itself is so unstable. So that is one point. Second is that when we talk about analytes where our own IQC data shows us that the analyte is extremely robust. And the best example is our basic biochemistry parameters like total protein and albumin. If we go back and look at our IQC data of total protein and albumin, it is really very robust and you hardly have any IQC outliers. And it is the, the LJ chart would be one of the best when it comes to albumin or total protein. So what I mean is that consistently over the last three months, six months, if you look at the data, and when you look at it, when I, when I say three to six months, obviously it is taken into consideration different reagent lots. The, the mean and the standard deviation is hardly deviated. So when you have such a robust IQC parameter, then do you really require large number of patient samples and QC to be done for such a parameter as lot to lot validation? And hence the author says that for such parameters also, we can do only QC and not have patient samples. The third is he talks about certain tests where there is an inherent lot of variability. And I think in this, the majority of our immunoassays would fall where there is a lot of variability in terms of our IQC data. Examples are beta HCG and folate as a classical example, where we should use maximum number of samples as a part of our lot to lot validation. And should be, it should be a combination of QC as well as patients. The author has also proposed a model for these, these three groups as to how many number of controls replicates that you would use and how many number of patient samples, that is retained patient samples that we would use as a part of the study. So I think this was a very good article which tries to categorize our in-house tests based on our IQC performance and based on the analyte stability. And we can use this as a model and we can use this as a reference document for uh, you know, making our policy for reagent lot to lot validation. This is one approach which I shared with you. Now, what is the other approach which is there available to us? 
The other approach again it comes from CLSI, and uh, there is a document which is EP twenty six A. Now this is an extensive and uh, very elaborate document, and if you go through it, you will realize that there is a lot of statistics involved. And it, what it is asking us is to first define and first derive a critical difference test-wise based on our IQC data and use this critical difference then to use various you know, or tables which are present in this document to, to come to the answer for the number of samples being used. Not only that, this document uh, tells us to use the use different number of samples for different concentrations. So when I talk about a simple test like glucose, it is asking us to use certain number of samples for a low level glucose, and it is asking us to use certain number of samples for high level glucose. And that will be dependent upon the critical difference which you have derived based on your IQC data. So what it means is for a simple test like glucose, it may amount to as high as almost 15 to 20 samples uh, across the measuring range being used as a part of lot to lot validation. So when I say this, you can understand this, you need to extrapolate test by test across the test menu that you have. And hence majority of the labs find implementation of EP26A a Herculean task, more of a burden, and it is definitely adding to the labor and the cost of the lab. So many, many of the other reference laboratories across the world have developed their own protocols and I have even published them. I will show you some of them in the subsequent slides. And there are certain regulatory bodies, local regulatory bodies, which have also given certain recommendations which we can rely upon. So what I'm going to show in the next subsequent slide is about the two published documents, one from Mayo Clinic Laboratories, what they have done uh, as an option or as an alternative to EP26A. And I will show you what our NADL 112 talks about as a guidance for lot to lot reagent validation. So when you talk about Katzman and, Katzman and Tall, this is a paper published from the Mayo Clinic. And there is one more paper published from McMaster University and they have given their own protocols as an option or an alternative to EP26A. So what they are saying that they would like to use uh, Mayo Clinic would say I would use 20 samples while the McMaster University would you use 10 samples. I've seen other publications which are talking about even using five patient samples. But one thing is common across all of them is that whether it is 20, 10 or five, the, the choice of samples has to be across the analytical measuring range. So it should have low, mid and uh, high patient samples being included in it. And the the statistical tool used for deriving the acceptance criteria has to be a linear regression analysis where they would use the statistics of linear regression curve with the, the R, R square being more than 0.95 or the mean difference between the reagent lots less than 10% across all the, all the values that I'm looking at for each sample wise. So this is one approach that these people have recommended uh, using uh, as high as 20 and as low as five number of samples. Uh, this is what our NADL 112 2019 published document talks about as a generic uh, you know, guidance for how to go about reagent lot to lot validation. So NADL 112 I think has been quite considerate and taking the Indian uh, scenario uh, in mind. So we are talking about at least minimum of uh, two patient samples and QC samples. So NABL is talking about a combination being used that is quality control samples and patient samples and the patient samples that we choose should be across the measuring range. And they have given a general acceptance criteria of plus minus 10% bias as a general blanket uh, criteria to be used. Uh, or you can go by the percentage, uh, or sorry, uh, your standard deviation based on your IQC data as within one SD as the difference. And they have also categorized it specifically for chemistry, for hematology, serology, and molecular assays. And uh, one can go through this NABL 112. Uh, this is the same thing which I have pulled out as, as what NABL 112 talks about. So 
this is the second approach. This is the other approach which the Enable 112 is talking about. Now talking something about the acceptance criteria, how do we go about that? So uh, when we look at the literature again, uh, the whole model is uh, developed on what is called as Milan's criteria. And the Milan's criteria for developing acceptance criteria for lot to lot reagent validation is on three basic points. Uh, criteria based on clinical outcomes, which is very, very difficult to comply. And uh, you have to do ROC curve analysis for this. And it is not something which is easy to do and mostly not used. Uh, criteria based on biological variation database. This is something which is majority of the labs are using today. And that uh, is- sir, uh, Rajesh, sir, sorry to interrupt you. We have two more minutes to conclude. Thank yes. You. So uh, this is the one which is uh, majority of the labs are using today. And I think is the way forward. And last but not the least uh, is where uh, you have certain parameters where you do not have the information yet available in the biological database, variation database. So in those parameters, we can rely upon our own IQC performance and the standard deviation from our IQC performance, or we can rely upon the variability given in the EQA performance of that particular test. And last but the no, not the least is the last slide that once you have done a reagent lot to lot validation, how do you go about troubleshooting it in case if there is a failure in the in whatever approaches that you have used for reagent lot to lot validation. So when there is a failure, one should look at whether there is any trend or there is a single isolated sample, which is an outlier. If it's a single isolated sample, which is an outlier, it is worthwhile repeating it. And on repeat also, if you find it's an outlier, then probably it's an issue with the sample itself. And it is better to choose an another sample. If you have a trend that large number of samples which are going out, then I think there are two important points to be looked into. One should go back and look at the calibration, whether the calibration has been done correctly uh, with the new lot. And second is what is the acceptance criteria that you have used and applied and whether you applied it appropriately. So I think uh, uh, that is a way to go about in terms of uh, if there is a failure. And if you're not able to identify any specific root cause or any particular answer as to why you are you're failing, then it is best that you discuss with the vendor, probably ask for the new reagent lot, and do, but do not definitely put this reagent lot in use. And in that interim period, if it is, I know sometimes it can be difficult and you may not have a new reagent lot easily available, you may have to take a decision of outsourcing, outsourcing the test in that time or uh, you know wait till the new reagent uh, or shift to a different alternative platform if that is available to you. Uh, those are the other options that you need to look into in case that you're not able to identify the root cause. So um, that was my last slide. So uh, thank you.